God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Amen. I tell you, these August Sundays are getting slimmer and slimmer, aren't they? It's a good thing we have the deacons here, otherwise there'd just be a couple of us here this morning. I know there's about 150 people that are online, so that's great. Okay, maybe 35, we'll see. Uh, uh, just, so hi to every, everyone say hi to everybody who's out in virtual land. Just good to see uh, everybody. I want to give thanks to God for this beautiful morning that we are blessed with. What an what a absolutely beautiful morning it actually is this morning. Uh, beautiful because uh, the weather outside is just phenomenal. Beautiful because we have the opportunity to gather here to be in worship with one another and especially with our God. I have a couple of announcements that I'd like to lift up, but I think before I do that, I'm just going to welcome everybody. Uh, I know most of you are, are regular folk, but just want to celebrate wherever you are and whoever you are and wherever you've been on life's journey, you are welcome here. We celebrate your presence and give thanks to God for God's work in you and through you in our midst. So thank you. A couple of announcements I'd like to lift up. One, uh, you may have heard through the grapevine or read it somewhere, um, but we are now um, going to permit singing. Um, what we are asking is that if you are going to sing, we do request that you definitely have a mask on while you're singing, as singing is one of the most uh, prolific ways of spreading um, uh, COVID or any other illness. Um, and, uh, and we also know that the Delta variant is, is getting hold here in Rhode Island. Uh, so we just want to be aware of that. So we are inviting those who are able and wish to to stand during our hymns. We will still have the choir singing them virtually. Uh, and we're just invited to sing softly along with the choir uh, kind of to just help us feel a little bit more like it is church. Uh, so we're going to give that a shot for a little while. Hopefully the Delta variant doesn't uh, continue to gain steam and pick up. Uh, so, uh, and if it does, we'll need to reevaluate everything, but hopefully we're in good shape and moving forward. Along those lines, thank you to those of you that are willing to wear masks. Uh, I know the vast majority of us are fully vaccinated, um, but it is uh, to protect not only ourselves, but those who are unvaccinated and especially our children. And not just to protect our children, but also to, to help them know and feel that they are welcome here in our midst. It would feel odd, I think, if I were a child and I was the only one present um, wearing a mask and everybody else was allowed to go without. So um, thank you for those of you that are willing to do that. I think it means a lot to our ministry and to our community as a whole. The last announcement I'd like to lift up is just a big thanks. Our tech team does so much. Uh, and has for the last 18 months to get us to this point. Uh, so this past week there was a Windows update which of course made our entire online work not work. Uh, and so just want to lift up a shout out to Eric Ela who put in a lot of extra time this weekend to make sure, hopefully, a thumbs up, are we online? We're online to make sure that we were able to do that this morning. Uh, as of two o'clock yesterday afternoon, we weren't sure that was going to be an option. So again, thank you, Eric, uh, for your time and for the rest of our tech team, for Jeff, who's hosting today, um, for the work and effort that they put in to welcome those who are watching from home uh, and uh, or watching at a later time. Um, thank you to all of you for that. I think that is about all that I have for announcements. We'll share a little bit more about communion a little bit later in the service. It is a communion Sunday, and I think I'll just invite Linda to lead us in our call to worship. Good morning. Please join me in our call to worship. Lift up your voice and call out to God. We cry out, believing that God hears us. Come together and wait for God. We come together trusting that God is still speaking. Surely God's presence is here with us now. We wait in hope for God's steadfast love lifts our hearts. Come, worship the Lord. We celebrate the power of God that restores us.
please be seated. I thank you, O oh God, for this day, for being here with us this morning and for inspiring us to be here with you. May we open our hearts, may we open our minds, may we open the depths of our souls to the moving of your spirit, that as we gather this day, we may be moved through your love and through your grace that we may be transformed, that we may be renewed or healed, that we may find every blessing that you have in store for us during this time and throughout this day. Amen. I think it's time for our prayers of the people. And as we move toward our time of prayer this morning, we want to lift up the prayers that were raised through our uh, altar flowers this morning. So both arrangements are given by Fiona Nicholson. One is given in celebration of her daughter Laura's birthday, and the other is given in memory of her mother Patricia, who shared Laura's birthday. And so blessings and prayers and thanksgiving um, and honor. So for Patricia's life, and for Laura's life, let the people of God say, Amen. Amen. And so if there are any other announcements um, that come to us, I invite you to raise your hand and to share them with us. And Linda and I will then repeat them so that everybody can hear. So prayers for a friend who tested positive for COVID recently, even though vaccinated, which we're hearing more about. Um, definitely prayers of healing and prayers of comfort during this time. Prayers for all who are dealing with this. We know we have another member of our congregation who's been going through this too. And so prayers for those who are dealing with COVID still, it is still with us. So may God's presence be with your friend and with all who are dealing with this right now for health, for healing and for comfort. And let the people of God say, Amen. First of all, I think we're very grateful that you're here with us today, Gabby, because a lot of people haven't seen you for a while, and it's nice to have you here with us. So definitely prayers of gratitude for your journey and for how this church has supported you, and I couldn't say it better than you have. So, But also prayers for your father. I know uh, Carol did mention that last week. But prayers for your dad for um, going through this treatment and for his doctors and nurses and everyone to be there and support and for God's presence to be with him and help and hold him. Let the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Steve. We should offer prayer of gratitude for Linda's service here for a year and a half now. Yeah, and we should offer with a prayer of what going forward on a new adventure. <laughs> At, absolutely. So Steve is just lifting up uh, prayers of thanksgiving for Linda's ministry here with us. 
uh, as Linda's been here, oh my gosh, I'm not, a little over 18 months probably. About that, yeah. yeah. February 1st of 2020. So, it's been an interesting ministry here. It has been an interesting <laughs> ministry here with us. So Steve just wants to, to lift up prayers of gratitude, thanksgiving, and just celebrating you and your ministry, and then sending you forward with God's spirit as well, um, as Slatersville will be blessed through your interim ministry. Thank you. So let the people say, Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So just want to celebrate Jibby, celebrate all the children um, throughout the foster care program throughout Rhode Island and throughout our country. But um, Kathy is especially just giving thanks for our congregation, for reaching out, for being uh, a part of Jibby's extended family, for being that stable presence for him, which you have been certainly, Kathy, but so many people here being so welcoming to him. Um, and she's just giving thanks for that. I, I just I shared this with Boys Town. Yesterday, uh, last week when they were here, but it was amazing for me when we first went online, uh, going back to a year ago, March, when we very first went online, um, this community was so important to Jibby that in his group home that he was living in at the time, he actually went out of his way to the, the, the residents there and asked if he could use their phone to be able to watch our service online. And it's just, I can't imagine, how old is Jibby now? 12. About 12. I can't imagine too many 11 year olds, 10 to 12 year olds who would be in that same boat. Um, so it just, it just speaks to the love that he feels for us and the welcome that he feels here and the love that we have for him. So prayers for Jibby and thanks for our congregation. Let the people say, amen. amen. Okay. okay, let us gather our hearts in the spirit of prayer. Gracious God, you have heard our prayers this morning, prayers of thanksgiving and prayers of joy. And we are so grateful for those because they do remind us of your presence with us. We've also heard prayers of, of hope and healing, and we take those with that gratitude for your presence to know that you are with all of us and all of those who are going through such difficult times right now. We pray for them to feel your presence more strongly, for your loving arms to be around them and your love to just enfold them and uplift them. We pray for your healing presence and light to be with them as well. We pray for our world, we pray for our leaders, we pray for all those who need your guidance and your direction. And we lift up our voices now together in the prayer that our Lord taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning comes to us from the book of 2 Samuel, beginning with the 11th chapter at the 26th verse. And our reading this morning will bridge over between the, uh, the 11th and the 12th chapters. For those of you that don't know, uh, the books of Samuel, 1 and 2 Samuel, cover a lot of the life of David. Uh, and so we, this summer, the lectionary has been leading us through the life of uh, King David. And so we've been following that on and off through this summer and we continue uh, today with one of the more infamous stories of David. And I invite you to hear now the word. 
And so when the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made lamentation for him. When the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord, and the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city. One was rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. He brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. He used to eat, it used to eat his meager fare and drink from his cup. It would lie on his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take up one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer that had come to visit him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to visit him. Then David's anger at hearing this was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan then said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I appointed you king over Israel, and I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah, and if that had been too little, I would have added so much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in God's sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and have taken his wife, to be your wife, and you have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, for you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, I will raise up trouble against you from within your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this very son. For you did it discreetly, but I will do this thing before all of Israel and before the son. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. This ends our reading. Let us be in a moment of prayer. I mentioned earlier that we have been journeying with David on and off through this summer. And a few weeks ago, Linda introduced to us both David and Nathan, both the two main characters in our story today. Nathan was David's spiritual advisor. He was a prophet. He was God's mouthpiece to David during David's reign. And in many instances, he was David's conscience. Linda shared with us a few weeks ago that when David wanted to build a house for God, because David said, now that, now that we are at peace, now that Israel is settled, now that the tribes are together, now that we are not at war, now that we have founded 
the city of David, and I have the opportunity to live in a wonderful home, shouldn't I build God a wonderful home as well? And if you remember from that week, uh, initially Nathan said, that's a great idea, David, you go for it. But then Nathan went home and went to bed, and that night God spoke to Nathan, and God said, uh, Nathan, that's not such a good idea. Um, I mean, I don't mind a house, but I've actually been really happy having the freedom to live in the tabernacle in a tent and move about where I wish. And I'm not sure David is the right person to end up doing this, so let's put it off for a little while. And the next morning, Nathan then went to David and said, David, uh, God is, it does not want you to build a house, but God will build a house for you, your lineage, your children, your, your descendants who will be an eternal house, living for all ages and ruling. And we know from Christian tradition that Jesus is that fulfillment of that promise to David. But then David continues to live his life, and David, David, is, is, David is on one hand the quintessential faithful follower of God and the quintessential flawed human being who doesn't know what that means and makes mistake after mistake after mistake. In fact, that's probably way too light to talk about what David did to upset God today. I don't think we can necessarily call it a mistake. It certainly is, as David named it himself, sin. For those of you that know the story, the background of this story was this was the affair between David and Bathsheba. And that David had seen Bathsheba while the men, were told, the warriors were all off in battle. And David, who was the leader of the warriors, probably ought to have been there himself, but that's a sermon for another day. He was up on his rooftop surveying his kingdom and he sees Bathsheba bathing on the roof of the house next to his. Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, one of David's officers, who of course was off at war. So David calls to her and instigates an affair with her. And of course, I shouldn't say of course, but it would happen to be that she becomes pregnant. And so then David decides, well, I can't let my infidelity be known. So he builds sin upon sin and he invites Uriah home as a celebration for his victories. And says, take an evening or two and celebrate with your wife before you go back. But we're told that Uriah was such a righteous man that he would not be intimate with his wife while his soldiers were in the field, a foil again to David, and gets up and leaves without having been intimate or finding some excuse as to how Bathsheba could become pregnant. So David then takes it a step further, or maybe 20 steps further, and devises a great plan. He tells his other generals, send Uriah and his men up to the front of battle. And when they are in the heat of battle engaging the enemy, I want everyone to pull back so that Uriah and his men get slaughtered. And that is what happens. And with Bathsheba being a widow, David is free to then marry her and cover up the infidelity that he had perpetrated. Nathan gets wind of this. And he tells David this wonderful parable about the rich man who had everything and the poor man who had nothing but one little ewe lamb. And David is so angered by what this man of power, this man of authority, this man of privilege did to the poor man who had nothing. He says, this man will die for what he has done. And that's when Nathan comes back with the line that probably just about all of us love. You, David, are that man. As I read the passage this past week, I was just struck by how quick David was to be angry at someone else's injustice. How quick it was for him to judge this wealthy man. And yes, I would say in this parable, that wealthy man deserved to be judged for what he did. 
But how is it that David could be so quick to judge this, this rich man in the parable and yet be so utterly and completely blind to his own sin, to his own failings, to his own actions, which were exaggerated up and above what this man had done. David didn't just kill a lamb, he killed a human being to cover up his own fidelity and his own indiscretions and his own wants and desires. It makes me think sometimes how quick we are to judge other people, to point out their failings, to point out their faults, without even realizing our own. Sometimes we are so blind to our own faults and our failings, and so quick to point out the failings of others. And let me say this, everybody else has lots of failings. But how blind are we to our own? It reminded me of Jesus in his teaching here, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew, Do not judge so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you make, it shall be the judgment that you receive. And the measure you give will be the measure that you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take the speck out of your eye while there is a log standing in yours? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbors. My sermon title today, with a silly word included that is no word, is Are You a Logger or a Specker? <laughs> How quick are you to point out the specks in someone else's eye versus to recognize the log in your own? Each and every one of us, myself included, walk around with logs in our own eyes. None of us can sit here and say that we are righteous and that we are pure and that we are without sin. None of us can sit here today and say that we have not done, nor do we occasionally still, or perhaps more than occasionally, still do something wrong either by sins of commission or by sins of omission. Doing things we ought not do or not doing things we ought to do. This story of David, this criticism of Nathan, this teaching of Jesus invites us to look upon ourselves. Before we worry about what everybody else is doing, perhaps we can benefit from looking at ourselves. For only when we can see clearly can we truly see what others may be doing wrong. I wanted to give us a time, an opportunity this morning to sit with ourselves, to sit with God, to ponder just a little bit where we have maybe gone astray. What have we done this week, this month, or perhaps already this morning that we might need to recognize and pull from our eye, from our lives, that we might see as clearly as David saw once Nathan opened his eyes. I have sinned against the Lord. I'm going to give us a few moments to sit in silence, in reflection, to pray, to think, to talk with God, to just be, to look into ourselves. And if you feel so moved to confess to yourself and to your God where you have gone or are awry, that we might hand that over to God 
and be forgiven for what we have done or left undone. Let us be in a moment of prayer. O oh God, you have searched us and known us. You know our rising and our sleeping. You know when we are and where we are in every moment. All that we do, the good, the bad, the ugly, are all done in daylight for you. We come to you this morning to offer ourselves to you, to ask for forgiveness, to receive your grace, to let ourselves be renewed or recreated or remade or transformed even more closely to your image. For each and every one of us are precious in your sight. You know each of us by name, and you have numbered the hairs on our heads. With this faith, may we know that we have been forgiven through your love and through your grace, through the work and the teaching and the love of Jesus Christ. May his new life bring us new life as well. Let the people of God say amen. At this time, as we consider the ways that God's grace has been working in our lives, forgiving us and holding us through all of we've been through, it is also a time to think about the ways that God's grace works through us to benefit others in the mission of this church and out into the wider community. It is a time now for us to give a little back. So this morning's offering will now be gratefully received.
Gracious God, we thank you at this time for these gifts. We ask your blessing upon these gifts that they may go out into the world and be about your business as you see fit. We also ask your grace and your blessing upon the givers. May they also feel the, your love surrounding them and guiding them as they be about your business as well. Amen. So this morning we thought, since some of you were maybe not here the first time we did this, we would point out that this is our communion. It's uh, COVID friendly um, or not, whatever. So there's a uh, little wafer in one half of this and juice on the other half. You flip them over, kind of like an hourglass. Uh, what we're going to do is bless all the elements. The deacons will serve. And then we will take together so that we will also be doing the bread together and then the juice together. So when you get it, hold on to it, I guess is my explanation for you. And there are also trash cans, correct? Mm -hmm. In the back and the deacons will be bringing those around actually at the end. Ushers, the ushers, I'm sorry, the ushers will be bringing those around at the end so that you can dispose of it because we know there's no place to put it in the pews. And if you are home, we hope you have some communion elements to join us as well. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts and give thanks to God. Blessed are you, O God, who with your word and Holy Spirit created all things and called them good. In Jesus Christ, your word became flesh and dwelt among us. And through Jesus' suffering and death, you took upon yourself our sin and death and destroyed their power forever. You raised upon the dead this same Jesus, who now reigns with you in glory, and poured upon us your Holy Spirit, making us the people of your new covenant. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts that in the breaking of this bread and the drinking of this cup we may know the presence of the living Christ and be renewed as the body of Christ for this world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at your table forever. So on the night of his betrayal, after supper with his disciples, Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to them and he said, take and eat this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the supper, Jesus also took the cup. And again he gave thanks. And again he gave it to his disciples. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, spilled in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink as often as you do in remembrance of me.
opening the smaller side. Take and eat. This is the bread of life for you. And this is the cup of salvation. Let us pray. Eternal God, you have called your people from east and west, from north and south, to feast at this table of Jesus Christ. We thank you for Christ's presence and for the spiritual food which nourishes us. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we give you thanks. Keep us faithful to your will. Be with us through all our days. Amen. Amen. So we're going to sing our final hymn, which will be up on the screen. Thank you, deacons. Called as partners in Christ's service, called to ministries of grace, we respond with deep commitment, fresh through lines of faith to trace. May we learn the art of sharing, side by side and friend with friend, equal partners in our caring to fulfill God's chosen end. Christ's example, Christ inspiring, Christ's clear call to work and word. Let us follow, never faltering, reconciling folk on earth. Men and women, richer, poorer, all God's people, young and old, lending human skills together, gracious gifts from God unfold. Thus new partners for Christ's mission, in a small or global sense. Help us bear each other's burdens, breaking down each wall or fence. Words of comfort, words of vision, words of challenge said with care. Bring new power and strength for action, make us colleagues free and fair. So God grants us for tomorrow ways to order human life that surround each person's sorrow with a calm that conquers strife. Make us partners in our living, our compassion to increase. Messengers of faith thus giving hope and as you go forth this day, go forth with the love of God, go forth with the grace of God, go forth from this table, from this room, from this place, as reconciled and forgiven folk in God's great kingdom. Amen. Amen. Linda and I will be outside greeting people on your way out. It's not raining. <laughs>